Now I can officially uh, stop the share. We can, we can leave it. Oh, it's coming from YouTube, so I'm going to say no. So it's just going to be like a hard, a hard cut. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Joel at RevThink. We're welcome to another weekly briefing. This is a special event we are doing. Uh, our topic is we switched from uh, Frame.io to Assemble. And I'm excited that this is going to be uh, really a walkthrough uh, with Alex, who, Alex, what's the name of your studio again? I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, Sky Feather Studios. Sky Feather. Okay, good. I was about to say Feather Sky, Feather Light or something like that. So thanks for straightening me out. Um, but we're also excited to have uh, Nate from Assemble with us here. And a lot of you are curious about uh, Assemble as a tool, as a production management system uh, at RevThink. We've seen some really cool things about it. And we've been sort of on the inside uh, with Nate and his team going back quite a ways. Some of you that are in Confab may remember Nate came in and did a, a real private demo with us uh, some months back. So if you missed that and you're in Confab, uh, be sure to go check out that replay. Okay, we're gonna, here's our format. We only got 30 minutes because we try and keep this really brief. Uh, that's why we call it the briefing. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna uh, invite Alex to kind of walk through with us what was his before, what's his after experience. Nate is gonna be the resident expert that can also uh, chime in with the more official answers on some of the features and capabilities, also maybe some of the new things that uh, they have under development. As we go along, if you have a question or comment, drop it in the chat. I'll be watching that. So I might um, bring up your question and ask that to Alex or Nate as we go along. Uh, if we get past the half hour mark, we'll try and wrap at the half hour. We might save some of that Q&A uh, for afterwards, assuming uh, Nate or Alex don't have a hard out. Hopefully we can uh, maybe spend an extra 10 or 15 minutes if, if need be. With that, let me introduce folks. So Alex, please introduce yourself. Tell us about your company and what you guys do. For sure. Uh, so, you know, I'm Alexander, based out of Seattle here with, uh, I'm the creative director here for Sky for the Studios. And uh, primarily what we focus on is um, we're considered a digital content agency. So we generally locate other businesses out there who need to adapt their, you know, anything from visual aesthetics to auditory to marketing campaigns. So that could entail video production, photography, audio, basically the whole creative umbrella. And then we kind of um, sort of enhance that uh, aspect of each one of their uh, brand ethos. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we focus on these days um, for our uh, clientele. Got it. And by the way, if you could, can you check your audio? We were just noticing it's kind of breaking up or cracking a little bit. Maybe there's some, uh, something you can share sure. when you're in. Let me see real quick. Um, Nate, while he's uh, uh, noodling with that, can you introduce yourself and tell us uh, about your role at Assemble? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Nate Watkin. Uh, I'm actually a former producer for eight years, ran a production company, uh, most recently out of Venice Beach in Los Angeles, and uh, very familiar with the role of you know running a production company, producing, directing, wearing a lot of hats. And throughout my time at the production company, I was always looking for a tool. Uh, that we used to run our business and to manage our productions and everything we tried was like fitting a square peg into a round hole. And so uh, eventually decided we're going to go out and build it, found it assemble. This is about five years ago and have been building uh, really the platform that we always dreamed of having when, when, uh, when I ran my company. Uh, so I'm currently the CEO and um, excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You could, you could talk for a whole half hour just, Right, just just expanding on what you just said there. So uh, thanks for keeping it crisp, because well, I'm sure people will have some questions for you as we go along. Um, I should have also mentioned that at the end of the half hour, please stay tuned because uh, we will be sharing a special coupon code um, that will give you an extended trial period for anybody that wants to give Assemble a try. All right, Alex, let's start here. What was wrong? That, that precipitated you saying, man, we need to look at our method, put some sort of a new tool in place. What was happening inside your production company that necessitated some sort of a change? For sure. Um, I think the primary thing that, that we were running into in, I'm sure a lot of anybody who's been in the creative field has encountered this, is that um, we needed some sense of, of you know, standardization and, and something that, 
was missing from that when we were using our previous tools was it was just new formats left and right. Uh, when we were using other project tracking solutions, when we were sending out deliverables and we were interacting with clientele, uh, especially in this field, when you're interacting with so many different, you know, moving pieces, whether it's editors, whether it's, you know, VFX, audio guys, whoever, we just couldn't get the communication down. Uh, so having, you know, something that was one single repository that people could just kind of look for um, sorry about the audio issues. Having some uh, single repository that just both the client and also our uh, you know backend developers, editors, whoever could look towards as a resource is really what we needed. Um, and and you know that was anything as small as like shuffling through all these emails, shuffling through different you know project solutions, different logins, different subscriptions, just so many different things that felt unnecessarily complicated. That's primarily what drove us to assemble. So was I'm guessing there was some sort of a patchwork, right? Because I heard you say email. I think you said you were using Trello for some things. You're obviously using Frame.io. Um, what, yeah. what was the most common pain point that you would say, like when you're actually in production and you're bumping up against the limitations of that patchwork, what, what would happen that <laughs> would drive you crazy? Uh, I would say it was twofold. So with, when it came to Trello, the biggest issue we had was, and, and this is pretty much any major project tracking solution on the market that is is just a blank slate. You know, Trello, you sort of have to create the the building blocks. You have to create the the um, you know the formatting. You you have it's not designed for any sort of subset or industry. So having clients suddenly jump into these projects and us having to explain over and over again, you know, put your comments here, change this here, add this card, do this was just a nightmare for them. Um, same thing with emails. Uh, there might be one instance where we'd get new comments coming in and that suddenly is superseded by an entirely different position in somebody else's company who has another comment or you know going back you know months and seeing hey where did this where did this clip end up can we use this original footage just having to deal with all these different little things that were scattered everywhere um so and and then also having clients understand to the translation between non-creatives to creatives i would say especially when you're using something like assemble means that whenever i can hand this off to say an editor for instance on a current project they can look at it and say you know what's this team saying what's that team saying where is this time stamped as opposed to you know getting an email in the middle of the night that says hey you know the 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 room where the talent's in it looks weird well which room which talent where are you talking about having to go back and forth on that just it was a waste of frankly our time and, and their time so that was that was such a really valuable resource to have once we switched over to assemble yeah it's interesting how uh part of what i'm hearing you say is being able to more own the experience from the client side because when i think of a client logging into trello like my skin kind of crawls a little bit thinking oh my god that's such not a such not a curated experience nate i'm curious to drag you in you hear some of these problems that alex is talking about are these common themes that, that you hear from, from where you sit? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, <clears throat> I think you really hit the nail on the head. You know, I, <clears throat> this is something that I understand from running a creative shop myself is that you're, you're very cognizant of the client experience. You want it to feel branded. You want it to feel like a seamless experience. Um, and it was something that I always try to focus on, you know, when I was uh, a producer, and so that's really how we try to design assemble is that you would feel uh, good about sharing assets or presentations or anything directly from assemble or inviting someone into your workspace. Uh, and it's something that we're, we're continuing to iterate on, uh, have a lot of cool, exciting features coming out in, in regards to that as well. Yeah, that, that, when, we, when you think about it, right, maybe it's that we, when we start out and we're a freelancer, and we're doing projects, we're dealing with hundreds and thousands of dollars perhaps. And then someday you wake up and realize you're selling high ticket, $100,000 projects, and you're still using iCal and email and all these clunky things that just are, are basically cheap and ubiquitous, but they don't feel premium. Um, so Alex, let me ask this. So you make the switch. Um, how difficult was it, of course, to implement a new method? That's always a 
a question. And then were there any sort of early wins, early benefits, takeaways that you could share that people would maybe say, oh, okay, that's cool. For sure. Um, I would say that, you know, with, with any new, with any new resource, there's, there's always a little bit of growing pains, a lot less so with assemble because we didn't have to kind of reiterating what I said earlier, we didn't have to build the groundwork. Um, you know, there, there was always something with, uh, with other ones that wasn't quite there, you know, I guess the best way I would describe it is, is we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to rig it like it was something else. We didn't have to to band-aid fix that. So having that growing pain of the new format is is always something that you're going to encounter no matter what you're with. But but assemble made it a lot easier because it was designed for what we were doing in mind. Um, some of the early wins were just having everything uh, in in that once we started to get everything into one single repository, a lot of our clientele were really appreciative of just having something that they could just go to instantaneous to see those downloads. I mean, I can't tell you how how much of a relief it was to no longer be getting requests all of a sudden where it was like, hey, where's that Google Drive folder? Where's that uh, you know Dropbox link or where's you know all of these submissions? Especially when we had um, we had a very early on client who wanted to do like a brand explainer video and they just had all these ideas they were throwing out in a Zoom meeting like this for like different locations, different talent, different uh, you know, things that they wanted to communicate in the video. And we started to realize it would just be a lot easier to kind of throw everything at the wall and have them just pick and choose instead of having to put the client through this rigmarole of like, you know, what, what do you want? What are you talking about? Where do you want to go? Who's this? And instead of just having that, we had this great moment where we just said, you know, here's what we have. Here's what we have. Here's all the locations. Just go ahead and pick and choose, you know, pick and choose like you're, you're shopping on Amazon. We'll, we'll go ahead and get it, we'll get it ready for you. And then they could just go through on their own accord and just say, you know, I like that, approve this, approve that. And it was so much easier to just have that streamline with the, uh, the client experience. So that makes me wonder, and maybe this is a question that, well, you could Alex maybe answer, but maybe Nate, this is better for you. Is there, so, cause what I'm hearing there is yes, there's this opportunity where the platform lets clients come in and it's not just for your team and for your inner communications, it's also client facing stuff. Is there a way to manage who can see what? Because obviously there's gonna be notes that maybe somebody on my team, I don't know, I'm just thinking back to my day when an editor might be a little bit too candid about this client's being a pain in the ass and they accidentally put a comment on something that God forbid is outward facing. <laughs> For sure, there's a, there's definitely a way to split them, and we actually ran into this also with um, when we were using like Frame.io and we were using um, Trello is having to micromanage all these different permissions um, more often than not, especially uh, you know like you said in the production days, there's going to be things that I want to tell my you know editing team that I don't want the client to see at all. There's going to be mistakes that they don't need to know about. And having everybody uh, sort of segmented in that makes it so much easier, especially with, um, I would say, when we started assigning permissions to teams who were actually interacting with the uh, the end products was a lot easier in the sense that, like, say we have a business, for instance, we run into this a lot, where there might be a specific marketing department, and they're going to be the ones we're looking for advice on the latest cuts, the latest deliverables, as opposed to, say, you know, a CEO or like a CMO or somebody higher up, or even the admin team who might want to see the ad, but we just don't necessarily need them to see all these different little, you know, revisions or the lingo that we use in the industry, for instance. So yeah, having that granular permissions management has really helped us kind of basically see what's important and also get it to the right people. Dang. Um, Nate, do you want to add any color to that? And I was going to say, um, while you're answering that, Alex, could you potentially share? People are sort of chiming in and be like, man, I'd love to see this in action. Do you have an example or a current project or something that you might be able to share your screen? For sure. I have, um, I have, yeah, I have a minimal one, one that uh, doesn't require an NDA. So it's, it's going to be a little more bare bones than some of the other ones, but sure. definitely let me go ahead and share my uh, screen here. So you guys can see what the UI looks like. Is that showing up? Yeah, we're seeing it. Thanks. Perfect. So, yeah, I mean, here's one that, that I was talking about where we have like these different uh, phases here. And so this was a, a small brand explainer video we were essentially kind of taking, you know, a product that they have being in the creative phasing and sort of showcasing like 
what's the latest designs here's sort of these granular permissions over here where we have like their specific dev team and they're only you know seeing these visibility portions whereas like having our internal sky feather studios uh contractors or you know any employees who actually need to see specific comments um and then this was an example where we had like a location submission process so they had like an idea of kind of what they wanted but they sort of needed a breakdown of like what was most realistic so especially suiting their budget and things like that and then this is where we we sort of live in here which is like the editing things the you know this might be the the script this might be the website and a good example is like you know if we have let's see i'll open up this latest advertisement here which there's no cuts on this version too unfortunately but um they might see this right here where they have their customers or sorry their individual internal team interacting back and forth so right. i can go ahead and see what actually needs to be seen this is a the app developer for instance here's like the ceo of the startup and right. they can sort of delegate you know what they're all individually noticing and then i can translate that even into my editing team normally would live here who's Hey, you know, the client mentioned their their bag visibility was poor, the the cell phone was too dark, or something needs to be changed in there. Or even having we actually use the public review link a lot. So for instance, if you have a client who's on the go somewhere or you know, maybe only gonna see the video once or twice, we use this option as a sort of a public form where we can just send them out those links and they can sort of look at it, review it, and just sort of send out their comments that way as opposed to having the log in each time. So um yeah, I mean, this is this is like a high level overview of sort of what we're looking at. And then obviously you have like the, the final versions here that each one of the teams can see, you know, they can set the approval status, things like that. Or if yeah. I just need to see like, you know, spot, for instance. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, that's sort of the, the general overview of the UI. Maybe for people that don't uh, know this UI, I haven't have never seen it. Can you even give us a peek of what, what's under some of those side panels like overview and, and brief and calendar? For sure. The, these ones haven't been quite fleshed out because this is such a, a fairly recent project. But uh, normally when you live in here, you can develop out uh, creative briefing. So that might entail like, say somebody, and this, this is something we run into all the time. If you're onboarding somebody brand new with the team or brand new with your project, uh, this gives them a complete high level overview of all the different tasks that are occurring, all the different, uh, the creative brief is really where uh, where we find some of the biggest strengths. So once these are sort of developed out, normally in this project, you know, what's your budget, your deadline, your objective, the background, there's a lot that can go into this where somebody can basically jump in head first and be like, okay, I know who this is for, I know what it's about, I know what the budget is, I know where it's gonna be delivered, and maybe even including some like visual examples, especially for non-creatives who might have a, a general idea of the project, <clears throat> but need to see something that's already been executed to understand. Uh, the overview, like I said, is basically going to entail like all of your different tasks, you know, cast and crew on set. This could be when the deliverables are due. This could be even beyond that. So we have clients, for instance, who uh, we have one right now who might have a, a process between the legal work, patenting process to down to copywriting, down to your launch date, down to all of those individual things that we might need to see in our broad level overview. So having those on hand, not only for our editors, but also knowing like, hey, when do I need to actually get this out? Or who do, you know, who needs to see this? And then normally this would calendar would be a translation of that. I apologize for not having a more in-depth one right now, but you know, some of them are a little <clears throat> behind the scenes with the NDA and all that process. So um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, Nate, I'm sure there's th there's things that you're like, oh, if only he could show this, we'll show that. Um, do you want to share your <laughs> screen if there's anything else that you want to add? A sure, bit. yeah. Um, I'll do a, a two minute peek because I know we're short on time. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, uh, as you as you do this, Nate, too, there's a couple of questions happening in the chat that you might want to address as you go through it. Um, it's about the adoption rate in that are clients ready to really jump to a new platform and you know what's the benefit from them? So maybe you can show like how easy it is to use if you're sharing this with your client while you're while you're diving through it. Yeah, totally. And I would love for to hear Alexander's input on that as well. Um, but yeah, just to show you some, some quick things, a, a new feature or a set of features we just launched is the ability to add all different asset types. And so we have the ability to add what we call an asset, a gallery, or submissions. Um, 
fairly explanatory asset is an individual asset like Alexander just showed us that's going to have your frame specific commenting version control a lot of these features that uh, you all uh, love to use for these types of you know video reviews uh, galleries is going to be a collection of assets it could be photos uh, videos any sort of assets but it actually puts them into a self-contained gallery like this which is going to give you you know gallery viewing options grid view as well as the ability to star assets if you need to uh, mark selects. Uh, so a client can come in star assets. You can track how many have been starred and filter by starred assets as well. Great for selects process. Um, and then the last one, which Alexander touched briefly on is submissions, one that we're really excited about. But this is anytime you need to submit anything. So if this is a role you're trying to fill or maybe it's a location that you need to uh, uh, find a location for, you can create a submission, which essentially enables you to create a spec. You add a title and a description of what you're looking for, and then you can add submissions for that. So if I show you a fully built out one, for instance, in casting, let's say we're looking to fill this friend role. Here's what a submission looks like. Uh, this is going to show you, okay, here's our role, here's our spec. And then each of these is an individual self-contained gallery where you can upload photos, videos of an actor or actress, for instance, or even external links to a casting website or a location website or whatever that may be. And so when Alexander's talking about, you can give them this menu, they can come in here, look through all these options, they can build out a short list if they want, or they can just approve their favorite. And that's going to start to mark those as approved within your dashboard. So really just kind of gives you that ability to manage that process very well. Hey, Nate. Uh, do you yeah. have the ability to annotate on that photo? Like if somebody wanted to draw or make a mark to say, change this, move that on the photo itself, or is it all kind of note text based right now? Currently not, but annotations are high on our, our priority list. So that's definitely a feature we're going to be rolling out for both videos and photos and documents and everything. And then how does it handle 3D models? Uh, right now, we wouldn't natively handle a 3D model, but you, if you export it to any common file format, uh, it's going to accept it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, but to touch on your original question, I mean, for us, we don't see a lot of issues with client adoption from the customers we speak to because uh, it, there's zero friction when sharing a symbol. So sharing an asset is as easy as sending a link in an email. And they click the link and they can go in and start leaving feedback without having to create an account, without having to enter an email, nothing. It's the same as, as sending them a, a, an image from a Google Drive, except you get all of the great features packed in the assemble, uh, like frame specific commenting and everything else that goes along with it. Um, so we've really tried to minimize any friction at all to enable you to onboard clients and team as quickly as possible. But I'll, I'll pass back to Alexander for that. I would love to hear your experience on that as well. For sure. Uh, when it comes to sharing, I mean, we've we've had just basically every single instance of um, of adding those people, especially for ongoing projects, has been extremely seamless. Um, and what's great is once they're sort of on board, it makes it a lot easier to transition them into this sort of uh, this singular sort of repository. Like I said before. And when it comes to just people who are who really, you know, maybe maybe they don't want to deal with a login, maybe they don't want to, you know, create an account. They're only going to be seeing the project once. Uh, we do a lot of those review ones where it might just be as easy as just sending out a public link, and they can sort of hop in and add their feedback as they go. So uh, I'd say sharing has at least been one of the the strongest aspects of Assemble's, um, you know long-term goals, especially when you consider that you you have the flexibility to do as something as simple as just throwing it out there without an account, all the way down to the micromanaging if they're going to be more heavily involved in the long term. Yeah, I'm curious, Alex, because I heard you say, you know, sending somebody a link via email, but it sounds like once they get into the repository, hopefully they're actually migrating away from email and everything's happening in a symbol. Is that what I'm hearing? For sure. Yeah. I mean, ideally in the long term for, for everybody that we really work with, it's pretty much always just going to be an assemble uh, the, the platform, they'll log in, they'll see updates, they'll see the active tasks, they'll see the new cuts of something. Um, so having that there, especially even if they're out and about uh, ongoing is, is still extremely valuable. So like uh, 
for instance, you know, it, it could be as simple as just not having to, to, for us to do that email, just having a new cutout there and then sending out those notifications to know what's going on in the background. And I love this question from Sajil. Uh, he was saying about client comments. How do I know which person from the client end replied or gave corrections if just a link was shared with no login required? Yeah, so when they access that public link, if they try to do anything such as leave a comment or change the status, it simply asks them to enter their name. So you'll get their name to be able to track that. Got it. Yeah, I'm thinking of how frictionless that is for people like, you know, C-suite level people. God forbid they would have to log in and remember a password and all that kind of stuff. Those people just go mental <laughs> as soon as you put that little bit of friction up there. So that's, that's, that's very smart. And is it safe to say that um, it's easy to, when you're looking at all those comments, you can quickly sort and be like, okay, these are my internal team comments. These are the marketing team comments. These are the decision maker comments. How, how, how do you, how is that stuff arranged so that people can meaningfully sort and filter and so forth? You want to tackle that one, Alexander? Or... Oh, oh, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> At least in our experience, uh, it's it's basically just been either by team. So whenever you're actually using um, the the portioned out permissions, you can see who's coming from where. Uh, and then the other thing that we generally almost always use is if it's handed off to somebody, um, say an editor, for instance, gets the latest cut comments come in from the uh, from the business themselves, marking those as complete, and then also seeing who as um, you know, who is oldest and newest and having those categories. But generally we also will segment them based on uh, separate cuts completely. So, you know, 10, 10 comments come in from the business, all of those are marked as completed and a new revision goes out. We can see from there in each one of those different ones where it kind of started from start to finish. Does, is that kind of what you were looking for? Yes, yes. Yeah. And I know we're, we're short on time. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'll save some of these questions in, that are here in the chat. Uh, for after the half hour mark. Hopefully you guys can stick around uh, yeah. for a, a little bit longer. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this to, to, to hopefully wrap up at least this section of it. I'm curious to hear from you, Alex, why, like, what, how, how does this get you excited about the future when you think about how this impacts your business? What, what do you see is now possible? I would say just growth. I mean, the, the, the thing that we've encountered before has always been some ceiling, some drawback, something that almost needed a workaround. So especially for our business, having that long-term, you know, flexibility to, to say, Hey, I might have a client who's as small as this, you know, bakery that needs one video or a couple stills all the way up to like, you know, hey, we're throwing out a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollars spot. You know, for this for this Fortune five hundred company, they need everything. They need as big a team as possible. They're going to have a lot of people coming in, all seeing these different moving pieces. So I think for us, it's exciting to know that 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 the flexibility or the growth or the ceiling isn't really going to be what's holding us back anymore. Um, and not only that, I mean, it's something that really we've liked about Assemble in particular over other platforms is it feels like a lot of them sort of have this, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's almost like they're, they, they're a lot of behind the curtain feeling. Whereas I feel like Assemble offers a, a certain degree of, you know, dynamic flexibility as all these new features are coming in, as they're hearing things from the community. I mean, even just what we're doing right now, I've never really had this uh, level of micro experience from companies who are really looking at creatives and, and making their lives easier, whether it's like a business like mine or a freelancer out there who's just shooting a video a week, uh, having that level of like, okay, how do you guys operate? And then building that pathway out just has made the experience so much easier to grow into as a business. Well, let me do this. I'm gonna uh, give the, the code here that we mentioned because we're at the half hour mark and I know some people are going to have to bounce. So let me share my screen real quick and just say, um, Nate, is this what people will expect when they go? They can enter this code here, Rev, as in Rev community um, there. And what do, they, what do they get with that code? Yeah, so uh, right off the bat, you get a 30 month, uh, sorry, 30 day free trial. Uh, 
And then if you enter this code, you're going to get an additional month free. So really gives you a full two months free uh, by using that code. Super cool. And we'll also, of course, put a link in the community once we post the replay here. So you can just click on a link and uh, I think it'll automatically enter that code. Am I right, Nate? Uh, yep. Uh, no, no, no. The, the, no, you'll still need to enter that code. Yeah. Okay. So enter okay. that. Yeah. So Nate, let me, uh, let me, now that we're, uh, I asked kind of the big question to Alex, um, I guess my big question for you is what are you excited about when you look at where you are and where you're heading with Assemble? What's got you excited about the future? Maybe you can give us a little sneak peek into some of the other things you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, number one, we've really tried to build this platform around the customers and around creatives like Alexander mentioned. I, I really appreciate him mentioning that, but our focus is everything we build is built through the lens of creatives. And we really want this to be an all encompassing platform that you can use from pre to post. Uh, and we really feel like the final missing component to that, you know, we have calendars, task lists, asset management, file sharing and feedback, a lot of really advanced tools. Um, but the next component to that, that we are rolling out, and I saw it mentioned in the chat a little bit, is the ability to create documents within Assemble, uh, which I think is going to be a complete game changer. Uh, everything from simple documents such as meeting notes all the way up to call sheets or shot lists or uh, even presentations. So uh, that's something to keep an eye out for uh, later this year, beginning to roll out. But to me, that's uh, going to be the final piece that is really going to enable Assemble to be your one-stop shop uh, that can replace all tools. Wow, super cool. Yeah, I'm excited about that document. Uh, feature as well, because again, there's so much client facing stuff that's going to allow people to just present and communicate in a, I'll call it a premium way, you know, in, a, in an elite way, rather than, okay, here's your Google Doc link, and you feel like, well, this is, this is the same tool that, you know, we all use that's basically free. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys do with that. And I will say this, I mean, for, for RevThink's part, we're also excited just to kind of be on the inside with you, Nate, and your team, and, and very excited to see where you're going to be developing things. And maybe there's some ways that some of our tools and, and our clients can plug into some of the stuff un under the hood, as it were. So I'm, I'm just excited about maybe some possibilities there. Um, yeah. All right, well, let me do this. Um, we'll, we'll spend another uh, five or 10 minutes. So if you have a question or a comment that you've been holding on to, uh, feel free to drop it here. Of course, happy to bring you into the conversation as well. Um, Tim, did you see any questions that we missed that uh, you want to bring up specifically? Um, a good question. I, I've been posting uh, the links and such uh, for people to be able to find this on Rev Community and um, follow the link. So if you're in the chat, you'll see that there. Joel will also post that those links and that reference code on the community right now. I'm just writing that post for you right away. Okay, cool. Well, I do like this from Jay. A lot of the questions that people are asking, Nate, are really just like uh, access to files and, and visibility of certain files and file formats. Mm -hmm. So um, we know it does video and, and picture, but I think there are other uh, file formats out there. I don't know if you have an extensive list of what's out there or what, what your platform works with best. Yeah, so, so currently, uh, you know, videos, photos, documents like PDFs uh, and audio, as well as the external links you can add into the platform <clears throat> are the main assets. We're gonna continue expanding that. You know, eventually we would love to have, you know, like native Photoshop support uh, or things of this nature. So that's certainly on the roadmap. Um, but right now in terms of like as a review platform, it's, it's really used for whatever you're exporting and sending to the client, you can, you can upload to assemble for feedback. Great. I know there was a question about annotations, like actually on images. Do you do you currently support that on video, but not other file formats, or is it is that all in the works? It's all in the works. Yeah. Currently, we have the frame specific commenting where you can drop it on the timeline, but uh, that's definitely high priority is the, the on screen annotations. So here's a really simple question because this is a good one from Jay. I would I would I would totally ask the same question. How do you handle resource management in a symbol like scheduling editors, designers, etc. That's such a basic question. Like I'm sure that's basic, like the most basic feature that the thing does. But I don't know if Nate, maybe you could even share what that looks like, or Alex, if you have an example, could one of you share? 
Yeah, so the calendar is certainly the the uh, the basis for that. Um, I, I'm happy to share my screen here in just a moment. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. So within the calendar, um, you can of course build out your production calendar. You can also switch to this timeline view, which enables you to see it broken down by phases. Um, this is really the groundwork for that resource management, and it's something that more features are rolling out uh, very very shortly, actually. One of the upcoming features is um, if you open one of these events, you can create subtasks and assign these to people. But uh, one of the features rolling out is you're going to be able to assign that actual master event or master task, as we call it, to somebody as well and see them on the timeline here. So if you're booking your editor, uh, you know, for two weeks, for instance, uh, you'll be able to assign your editor to this and see visually that your editor is booked for that period of time. Um, and then when you jump back out to the master calendar, so uh, let's get in the master calendar here, you can really begin to see all of your projects stacked up against each other and see, you know, kind of who's working on what. Um, well, any other questions, any other comments? Anybody, anybody else want to jump in before we wrap it up here? I know we're about 12 minutes long, so I appreciate everyone else uh, sticking around. Tim, you got anything else for us? Um, all the questions are cleared, so that was really great. I saw, I saw one, one back there I wanted to address. Oh, sure. uh, it was the question that there's a five project limit. Um, that's only on the starter plan, which is $19 a month. If you add any storage package, which starts at an additional $10 a month, you get unlimited projects. Oh, wow. Okay. Unlimited. Nice. Okay. Well, everyone, please give Alex and Nate a little round of applause, a high five, a thank you. Yes, awesome to have you guys here. Um, Alex, I'm excited to uh, have you, of course, as a member of the community now, so you can be one of our uh, resident assemble uh, evangelists or, or whatever the whatever your sure. title might be. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Nate, of course, you're in the community as well. So if people have questions, comments, whatever, how should they, how, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, um, happy to you know post in the community. I'm happy to jump in and, and interact there. Uh, or uh, you can always reach me, Nate at Assemble.tv. We love hearing feedback from customers and potential customers. So uh, happy to chat. That's one email you don't mind getting, right, Nate? Yeah, love it. I love <laughs> the awesome. All right, well, we appreciate you guys. Uh, Tim, we should remind everyone here that we exist to help each of you thrive in business and life and career. So hopefully this is a good conversation. We appreciate everyone coming to the weekly briefing. So we'll be back again next Thursday for updates from the industry. We'll be talking about trends and other good things. Um, Tim, sign us off. Yeah, it's great to have you guys all here. Thanks for being part of what we do and we'll see you next week. Okay, bye everyone. Guys.